Sighed Maisie, a lazy bird hatching an egg. I'm tired and I'm bored and I've kinks in my leg from sitting, just sitting here day after day. It's work. How I hate it. I'd much rather play. I'd take a vacation, fly off for a rest, if I could find someone to stay on my nest. If I could find someone, I'd fly away free. Then Horton, the elephant, passed by her tree. Hello, called the lazy bird, smiling her best. You've nothing to do, and I do need a rest. Would you like to sit on the egg in my nest? The elephant laughed. <laughs> Why, of all silly things, I haven't feathers and I haven't wings. Me on your egg? Why, that doesn't make sense. Your egg is so small, ma'am, and I'm so immense. Tut, tut, answered Maisie. I know you're not small, but I'm sure you can do it. No trouble at all. Just sit on it softly. You're gentle and kind. Come, be a good fellow. I know you won't mind. I can't, said the elephant. Please, begged the bird. I won't be gone long, sir. I give you my word. I'll hurry right back. Why, I'll never be missed. Very well, said the elephant, since you insist. You want a vacation? Go fly off and take it. I'll sit on your egg and I'll try not to break it. I'll stay and be faithful. I mean what I say. Toodaloo, sang out Maisie and fluttered away. Hmm, the first thing to do, murmured Horton. Let's see. The first thing to do is to prop up this tree and make it much stronger. That has to be done before I get on it. I must weigh a ton. Then carefully, tenderly, gently he crept up the trunk to the nest where the little egg slept. Then Horton the elephant smiled. No, oh, that's that. And he sat. And he sat. And he sat. And he sat. And he sat all that day. And he kept the egg warm. And he sat all that night through a terrible storm. It poured and it lightninged. It thundered and rumbled. This isn't much fun, the poor elephant grumbled. I wish she'd come back, cause I'm cold and I'm wet. I hope that that Maisie bird doesn't forget. But Maisie, by this time, was far beyond reach. Enjoying the sunshine way off in Palm Beach, and having such fun, such a wonderful rest, decided she'd never go back to her nest. So Horton kept sitting there day after day, and soon it was autumn. The leaves blew away, and then came the winter, the snow and the sleet, and icicles hung from his trunk and his feet. But Horton kept sitting and said with a sneeze, I'll stay on this egg and I won't let it freeze. I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. <laughs> So poor Horton sat there the whole winter through, and then came the springtime with troubles anew. 
<laughs> His friends gathered round and they shouted with glee. Look, caught in the elephants up in a tree. <laughs> they taunted, they teased him, they yelled, how absurd. Old Horton the Elephant thinks he's a bird. <laughs> they laughed and they laughed, then they all ran away. And Horton was lonely. He wanted to play, but he sat on the egg and continued to say, I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. No matter what happens, this egg must be tended. But poor Horton's troubles were far, far from ended. For while Horton sat there, so faithful, so kind, three hunters came sneaking up softly behind. He heard the men's footsteps. He turned with a start. Three rifles were aiming right straight at his heart. Did he run? He did not. Horton stayed on that nest. He held his head high and he threw out his chest. And he looked at the hunters as much as to say, Shoot if you must, but I won't run away. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. But the men didn't shoot. Much to Horton's surprise, they dropped their three guns, and they stared with wide eyes. Look, they all shouted, can such a thing be? An elephant sitting on top of a tree. It's strange. It's amazing. It's wonderful. No, don't shoot him. We'll catch him. That's just what we'll do. Let's take him alive. Why, he's terribly funny. We'll sell him back home to a circus for money. And the first thing he knew, they had built a big wagon with ropes on the front for the pullers to drag on. They dug up his tree, and they put it inside, with Horton so sad that he practically cried. We're off, the men shouted, and off they all went, with Horton unhappy 100%. Up out of the jungle, up into the sky, up over the mountains ten thousand feet high, then down, down the mountains and down to the sea, with the cart, with the elephant, egg, nest, and tree. Then out of the wagon and onto a ship, out over the ocean, and oh, what a trip! rolling and tossing and splashed with the spray and Horton said day after day after day I meant what I said and I said what I meant but oh am I ceasing one hundred percent after bobbing around for two weeks like a cork they landed at last in the town of New York all ashore, the men shouted, and down with a lurch went Horton the elephant, still on his perch. Tied onto a board that could just scarcely hold him, bump, Horton landed, and then the men sold him. Sold to a circus. Then week after week, they showed him to people at ten cents a peak. They took him to Boston, to Kalamazoo, Chicago, Weehawken, and Washington, too. To Dayton, Ohio, St. Paul, Minnesota, to Wichita, Kansas, to Drake, North Dakota, and everywhere, thousands of folks flocked to see and laugh at the elephant up in a tree. Poor 
Where Horton grew sadder, the farther he went. But he said as he sat in the hot, noisy tent, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful, 100%. Then, one day, the circus show happened to reach a town way down south, not so far from Palm Beach. And dawdling along way up high in the sky, who of all people should chance to fly by? But that old good-for-nothing bird runaway Maisie, still on vacation and still just as lazy. And spying the flags in the tents just below, she sang out, What fun! Why, I'll go to the show! And she swooped from the clouds through the open tent door. Good gracious, gasped Maisie. I've seen you before. <gasps> Poor Horton looked up with his face white as chalk. He started to speak, but before he could talk, there rang out the noisiest ear-splitting squeaks from the egg that he'd sat on for 51 weeks. A thumping, a bumping, a wild, alive scratching. My egg, shouted Horton. My egg! Why, it's hatching! But it's mine! screamed the bird when she heard the egg crack. The work was all done. Now she wanted it back. It's my egg! she sputtered. You stole it from me! Get off of my nest and get out of my tree! Poor Horton backed down with a sad, heavy heart. But at that very instant, the egg burst apart, and out of the pieces of red and white shell, from the egg that he'd sat on so long and so well, Horton the elephant saw something whiz. It had ears and a tail and a trunk just like his. And the people came shouting, what's all this about? They looked and they stared with their eyes popping out. Then they cheered and they cheered and they cheered more and more. They'd never seen anything like it before. They shouted, my word, it's something brand new. It's an elephant bird. And it should be, it should be, it should be like that. Because Horton was faithful. He sat and he sat. He meant what he said and he said what he meant. Happy 100%. On the 15th of May in the jungle of Newell, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the pool, he was splashing, enjoying the jungle's great joys, when Horton the elephant heard a small noise. So Horton stopped splashing. He looked toward the sound. That's funny, thought Horton. There's no one around. Help! Then he heard it again. Just a very faint yelp as if some tiny person were calling for help. I'll help you, said Horton. But who are you? Where? He looked and he looked. He could see nothing there but a small speck of dust blowing past through the air. I say, murmured Horton, I've never heard tell of a small speck of dust that is able to yell. So you know what I think? 
Why, I think that there must be someone on top of that small speck of dust. Some sort of a creature of very small size. Too small to be seen by an elephant's eyes. Some poor little person who's shaking with fear that he'll blow in the pool. He has no way to steer. I'll just have to save him. Because, after all, a person's a person, no matter how small. So gently, and using the greatest of care, the elephant stretched his great trunk through the air. And he lifted the dust speck and carried it over and placed it down safe on a very soft clover. Humph! Humphed a voice. Twas a sour kangaroo. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Help, too. Why, that speck is as small as the head of a pin. <laughs> a person on that? Why, there never has been. Believe me, said Horton, I tell you sincerely, my ears are quite keen, and I heard him quite clearly. I know there's a person down there, and what's more, quite likely there's two. Even three! Even four! Quite likely... A family, for all that we know. A family with children just starting to grow. So please, Horton said, as a favor to me, try not to disturb them. Just please let them be. I... I think you're a fool, laughed the sour kangaroo. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Me too. <laughs> you're the biggest blame fool in the jungle of Noor. And the kangaroos plunged in the cool of the pool. What terrible splashing, the elephant frowned. I can't let my very small persons get drowned. I've got to protect them. I'm bigger than they. So he plucked up the clover and hustled away. Through the high jungle treetops, the news quickly spread. He talks to a dust speck. He's out of his head. Just look at him walk with that speck on that flower. And Horton walked, worrying, almost an hour. Should I put this speck down? Horton thought with alarm. If I do, these small persons may come to great harm. I can't put it down, and I won't. After all, a person's a person, no matter how small. Then Horton stopped walking. The speck voice was talking. The voice was so faint he could just barely hear it. Speak up, please, said Horton. He put his ear near it. My friend, came the voice. You're a very fine friend. You've helped all us folk on this dust speck no end. You saved all our houses, our ceilings and floors. You saved all our churches and grocery stores. <gasps> you mean, Horton gasped, you have buildings there too? Oh yes, piped the voice, we most certainly do. I know, called the voice, I'm too small to be seen, but I'm mayor of a town that is friendly and clean. Our buildings to you would seem terribly small, but to us who aren't big, they are wonderfully tall. My town is called Whoville, for I am a Who, and we Whos are all thankful and grateful to you. 
Van Horten called back to the mayor of the town. You're safe now. Don't worry. I won't let you down. <laughs> but just as he spoke to the mayor of the speck, three big jungle monkeys climbed up Horton's neck. The Wickersham brothers came shouting, What rot? This elephant's talking to who's who are not. There aren't any who's, and they don't have a mayor. And we're going to stop all this nonsense. So there. They snatched Horton's clover. They carried it off to a black-bottomed eagle named Vlad Vladikov. A mighty strong eagle, a very swift wing, and they said, Will you kindly get rid of this thing? <coughs> and before the poor elephant even could speak, that eagle flew off with the flower in his beak. All that late afternoon and far into the night, that black-bottomed bird flapped his wings in fast flight. While Horton chased after with groans over stones that tattered his toenails and battered his bones and begged, Please don't harm all my little folks who have as much right to live as us bigger folks do. But far, far beyond him, that eagle kept flapping, and over his shoulder called back, Quit your yapping! I'll fly the night through! I'm a bird! I don't mind it! And I'll hide this tomorrow, where you'll never find it! <laughs> and at 6.56 the next morning, he did it. It sure was a terrible place that he hid it. He let that small clover drop somewhere inside of a great patch of clovers a hundred miles wide. Find that, sneered the bird. But I think you will fail. <laughs> and he left with a flip of his black-bottomed tail. Horton. I'll find it or bust. I shall find my friends on my small oh. speck of dust. And clover by clover by clover with care, he picked up and searched them and called, oh. Are you there? But clover by clover by clover, he found that the one that he sought for oh. was just not around. And by noon, poor old Horton more dead than alive, oh. had picked, searched, and piled up nine thousand and five. Oh. Then, on through the afternoon, hour after hour, till he found them at last on the three millionth flower. My friends, cried the elephant, tell me, do tell, are you safe, are you sound, are you whole, are you well? From down on the speck came the voice of the mayor, we've really had trouble, much more than our share. When that black bottom birdie let go and we dropped, we landed so hard that our clocks have all stopped. Our teapots are broken, our rocking chairs smashed, and our bicycle tires all blew up when we crashed. So, Horton, please, pleaded that voice of the mayor's. Will you stick by us who's while we're making repairs? <laughs> of course, Horton answered. Of course I will stick. I'll stick by you small folks through thin and through thick. <laughs> Humph, humphed a voice. For almost two days, you've run wild and insisted on chatting with persons who have never existed. 
Such carryings on in our peaceable jungle. We've had quite enough of your bellowing bungle. <laughs> and I'm here to state, snapped the big kangaroo, that your silly, nonsensical game is all through. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Me too! <laughs> With the help of the Wickersham brothers and dozens of Wickersham uncles and Wickersham cousins and Wickersham in-laws, whose help I've engaged, you're going to be roped and you're going to be caged. And as for your dust speck, <laughs> that we shall boil in a hot steaming kettle of bezel nut oil. <laughs> Boil it, gasped Horton. Oh, that you can't do. It's all full of persons. They'll prove it to you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Horton called. Mr. Mayor, you've got to prove now that you really are there. So call a big meeting. Get everyone out. Make every who holler. Make every who shout. Make every who scream. If you don't, every who is going to end up in a bezel nut stew. And down on the dust speck, the scared little mayor quick called a big meeting in the Whoville town square. And as people cried loudly, they cried out in fear. We are here! We are here! We are here! We are here! The elephant smiled. That was clear as a bell! You kangaroo surely heard that very well! All I heard, snapped the big kangaroo, was the breeze and the faint sound of wind through the far distant trees. I heard no small voices, and you didn't either. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, Me neither. <laughs> Grab him, they shouted, and cage the big dope. Lasso his stomach with ten miles of rope. Tie the knots tight so he'll never shake loose. Then dunk that dumb speck in the bezel nut juice. Horton fought back with great vigor and vim, but the Wickersham gang was too many for him. They beat him, they mauled him, they started to haul him into his cage, but he managed to call to the mayor, Don't give up! I believe in you all! A person's a person, no matter how small! And you very small persons will not have to die if you make yourselves heard! So come on now and try! <laughs> grabbed a tom-tom. He started to smack it. And all over Whoville, they whipped up a racket. They rattled tin kettles. They beat on brass pans, on garbage pail tops and old cranberry cans. They blew up bazookas and blasted great toots on clarinets, oompahs and boompahs and flutes. of loud racket rang high through the air. They rattled and shook the whole sky, and the mayor called up through the howling mad hullabaloo. Hey, Horton, how is this? Is our sound coming through? And Horton called back, I can hear you just fine, but the kangaroo's ears aren't as strong quite as mine. They don't hear a thing. Are you sure? Your boys are doing their best. Are they all making noise? Are you sure every who down in Whoville is working? Quick, look through your town. Is there anyone shirking? 
town rushed the mayor from the east to the west, but everyone seemed to be doing his best. Everyone seemed to be yapping or yipping. Everyone seemed to be beeping or bipping. But it wasn't enough for this ruckus and roar. He had to find someone to help him make more. He raced through each building. He searched floor to floor. And just as he felt he was getting nowhere and almost about to give up in despair, he suddenly burst through a door and that mayor discovered one shirker quite hidden away in the Fairfax Apartments, apartment 12J. A very small, very small shirker named Jojo was standing, just standing and bouncing a yo-yo. Not making a sound, not a yip, not a chirp. And the mayor rushed inside and he grabbed the young twerp. And he climbed with the lad of the Eiffelberg Tower. This, cried the mayor, is your town's darkest hour. The time for all fools who have blood that is red to come to the aid of their country, he said. noises in greater amounts. So open your mouth, lad, for every voice counts. But he spoke as he climbed. When they got to the top, the lad cleared his throat and he shouted out, Yap! Yap! <laughs> and that yap, that one small extra yap put it over. Finally, at last, from that speck on that clover, their voices were heard. They rang out clear and clean, and the elephant smiled. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> They've proved they are persons, no matter how small. And their whole world was saved by the smallest of all. <laughs> how true! Yes, how true, said the big kangaroo. And from now on, you know what I'm planning to do? From now on, I'm going to protect them with you. And the young kangaroo in her pouch said, <laughs> Me too! From sun in the summer, from rain when it's fallish, I'm going to protect them, no matter how smallish.